Right now, to keep the, the fun rolling, we are bringing in one of my favorite speakers, a person I've had the pleasure of hosting, I think, five, six times now, more than almost any other individual conservationist in the world, and that is Rosamia Gaia. So her, I don't want to steal her thunder, because her personal story in leading to her role in protecting a really amazing species in the cotton top tamarind is incredible. So we are going to dive in with her. We're going to head from Brazil up to the northern coast in Colombia to learn a little bit about her work protecting these really charismatic and beautiful and delightful monkeys. Uh, so Rosamira, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening and uh, welcome in. Nice to see you again. Hi, Jesse. Good to see you. Amazing to be here with you again and sharing with every uh, everybody who's connecting yeah, today and through the weekend to this amazing event. I think it's a third year, right? Third year. And I think by the time wow. we'll finish this one, it'll be over like 250 total events with conservationists around the globe. So it's like we just don't sleep. We have a great time. We <laughs> have an audience from around the world, speakers from around the world. It's so, so much fun. You're amazing, guys. Thank you for putting this together and giving all of us the opportunity to share our stories. And I enjoyed very much seeing Arnaud. It has been a while since we met and uh, yeah. admire his work as well. Hey, networking is half our fun. After the talk, we can get you guys all together. We'll have a virtual get together. <laughs> uh, but please do. We'd love to hear about your work with the, the tamarinds. And so if you want to dive in with your presentation. Uh, I, I will. I will. And uh, let me get this uh, rolling. Yes. So Beautiful. This, Look at that. <laughs> this is our beloved little cotton tops. Uh, they look big on this screen, probably, but they're just about the size of a squirrel. And they live in these amazing forests in northern Colombia, the tropical dry forest. It's uh, called the tropical dry, you know, as opposed to a tropical rainforest, because it's got, you know, six months out of the year is very dry and then lots of rain. And there, that's where our beautiful, you know, crazy hair monkey lives. Uh, even though he's just one pound, one pound monkey, size of a squirrel. It's very similar to us humans, you know, they uh, live in family groups like we do. They're very, very territorial, just as we are humans, right? Um, juvenile cotton tops leave their home or sometimes they get kicked out of the house, just like we do, <laughs> to go and uh, find our own territories and, uh, and um, uh, make our own families. They have a very sophisticated vocalization system, just like a language for us humans. And um, they feed from fruits. And you just saw one of those eating a little uh, insect there and uh, nectar and sap from trees. And they have an amazing role in the forest where they live. And it is that they're seed dispersers. They eat so many different fruits that grow in the trees in the forest. And then when they move around their territory and they're pooping, all of these seeds are coming out down to the ground and, you know, becoming new trees. So, you know, aside from the size difference, they're very much like humans, you know, it's uh, primates after all, right? But I want you to take uh, with you two main facts about cotton top tamarinds today. One, the fact that they're only found in that little red dot uh, in our huge planet is the country of Colombia, and not even in the whole country, just on that little black stripe of land that you see in the northwest region of our country in Colombia. That's it. You don't find them anywhere else in the wild, in Colombia or in anywhere in the world. So they're very unique and very special little monkeys. And the other fact is that, unfortunately, like many other wildlife species that, you know, you'll see about or you hear about, during the festival this weekend, they're you know, highly threatened. And it's mostly, in the case of cotton tops, it's mostly habitat loss. And that habit loss happens for, you know, development, um, cattle ranching, agriculture, you know, large scale, uh, but also for domestic uses like selective logging or uh, firewood, fences, construction. So usually farmers in local communities that, you know, are facing poverty, they go into the forest and cut trees. And they also hunt cotton tops for the pet trade, which is something that really, really breaks our heart. Um, that uh, is why cotton tops are considered a critically endangered species. Uh, we estimated that there's about 7,000 left in the wild. And the number doesn't say that much. It may seem a lot. But it's only in less than 8% of the forests that used to be in that little black stripe in northern Colombia. 
And not even all of that 8% is good for cotton tops because you need to have the trees that provide food and the trees that provide shelter and not all of the forests uh, that are left half of that. And they're very fragmented as well. So I, I am the director of Proyecto DT, which is a, a, a nonprofit organization based here in Colombia. It was founded by Dr. Ann Savage about 30 years ago. And we have four pillars of our work um, that support our mission to guarantee a long-term future for cotton top tamarins. Just avoid extinction, uh, give them a chance. And we do this by you know, conducting field research, which is the actually the beginnings of Proyecto DT were uh, as researchers, uh, but then given a lot of emphasis to forest conservation, of course, because it's the main threat. And that's what I'm going to focus more, more, most of our my, my presentation today, but also with a big social component on environmental education and providing uh, people in local communities with alternatives to generate an income and try or reduce that dependence on cutting trees and hunting animals for subsistence. So, um, we work in three different areas in Northern Colombia within that black stripe. And you see all those green dots that uh, in this map, this is what's left of the forest that is home to cotton top tamarins. So we work around protected areas in those blue circles uh, just to keep or protect whatever's left and try to increase that uh, forest size and connect it as well and work with communities around it as the focus of our conservation work. Our research is done with uh, telemetry. So we put a, a little backpack, like this one you see in the picture, to the dominant male of each fa family group. So the daddy carries the backpack. And that sends a signal that helps us find the monkeys in the forest. Because we're talking about a one pound monkey that hangs out 30 to 40 feet above the ground. And it's very elusive, doesn't like humans that much. So it helps us find them and study them. Um, our team, biologists and assistants go in, pick up the signal from the animal and take notes about everything they do. Just as, as I summarized in a minute, you know, we have learned all of that about cotton tops by observing them day after day uh, for many years now. So all of that information is so valuable, not only for sharing on publications and scientific journals, but for in using it for protecting the animal. And that is one of the things we're doing um, as we move forward. Uh, right now, we are conducting the third population census that we have done. The last one was 10 years ago. And we're going to confirm that 7,000 number and, and that 8% of forest through this work that is very intensive. We'll have some updated results after 10 years of working very hard to protect the species. And we're hoping that at least the populations are stable and, you know, Hopefully, or we're dreaming that it increases, but we'll see. Uh, that's part of the, the research work applied to conservation. And we have used all of that information in protecting forest, and which is the, the focus of my presentation today, being the, the main threat for cotton tops. And we, have, we are doing or are, have done this, you know, using three different strategies. One is working with environmental authorities to create protected areas, public protected areas. Um, working with them uh, to date over the last 10 years, we've been able to secure about 5,400 hectares in, pub in four public protected areas um, that probably protect just about 5% of what's left of cotton tops in, in this region, which is a significant number when you don't have that much left for the species and when deforestation is your main threat. But we're also using a second strategy, which is purchasing land. And we've been actually been very successful over the last three years. Uh, we started with 70 hectares and three years after we have almost 500 hectares. Uh, hopefully this year we will get there uh, of protecting forest for cotton top tamarins and of course for all, all wildlife, but forest that helps connect uh, protected areas and increase the habitat size and restore as well. Because some of these uh, uh, properties were used for cattle ranching and agriculture. And then our third strategy is connectivity because cotton tops always hang up, up in the trees and they never come down to the ground. So when they have this kind of landscape, then they get confined into islands and that can certainly hurt their long-term viability, their genetic viability. So that work is what you know I really, really love the most because it gives us a chance to work with local communities 
in creating these four corridors, like green highways for the cut and tops to move around and find resources and be able to mix, mix up genetically, if it, you know, so to, so to speak. Um, and we would love to buy much more land to protect, but it's unrealistic. So we work with farmers and create conservation agreements in partnership with other organizations in, in the area. And, uh, you know, we tell them, okay, what if we set aside the land within those yellow lines and we plant trees in it to create forests? And in turn, you get support for increasing productivity on your land using environmentally friendly practices, of course. Um, and we provide seeds, we provide uh, poultry, we provide uh, uh, wood trees, uh, fruit trees, um, honey uh, uh, production as well. And um, that way they get benefits and we get benefits. And we have created today this, this network that protects about a thousand hectares of uh, forest corridors. You can see our reserve on green in this map and how it's shaping up to connect the National Park, Los Colorados, to many other um, corridors and protected areas in, in the region. So we're creating basically a spider web of forest corridors that help monkeys have opportunities to move around and, and find resources and grow, you know, of course, and grow in populations. And we do this by, you know, uh, this all, all of this forest restoration work, this corridor restoration work is done by our team on the ground while they patrol our reserve. They collect seeds from the trees that we propagate in our nursery. Um, and it's mostly trees that provide food and shelter for cotton tops. So all of that scientific information we have picked up over the years is being used to restore the forest and to create forest that is good and viable for cotton top tamarins. And then we work with the farmers to plant those trees in these areas. Some of these areas are not easy to get to, so we have to, you know, use their burrows. We hire them to help us in this uh, labor and also, you know, digging the holes and planting the trees and helping us you know, bring bring this, uh, this forest back in areas that previously were used for cattle ranching and agriculture. This is very exciting for us because all of these people that you see in this picture are part of our staff and they're all hired from the local community. So what a, best, what a better way to engage your community than providing jobs. We wish we could do much more, but uh, these are our permanent staff, but we hire farmers that are participating in the conservation agreements and they help us plant those trees and they help us monitor, they help us transport, they help us, you know, propagate. They, you know, so it, it's a network of people in local communities that are helping us put this uh, restoration work together. And we have found that is, you know, it's helping their economies, helping their families, and they're getting engaged really emotionally and, you know, and also professionally with cotton tops and all of the efforts uh, to restore the forest. And you would think that that's where it ends, but then we have to monitor these saplings as they grow to make sure that they are surviving and they are uh, being healthy. So we monitor about 30% of the saplings we plant and uh, we go back every, you know, three months for the first year and then every six months and then once a year up to five years. And you can see our, our colleague Aldair there with the machete uh, kind of checking out the height of one tree that grows really fast is the Saba tree. Uh, after a year, it was, you know, three, three, three times uh, the size. And that's what it does, the tropics, you know, the heat and the humidity, that's a good thing. You know, it makes your heart really, it makes your work in the field really hard and tough with the humidity and the mud and everything, but everything grows really fast, which is very good. And this is what we want. We want cotton tops to be able to move around, to be connected, uh, you know, in this network and be able to find the resources they need to survive. And even though we talk about cotton tops all the time, we know that all of these efforts to protect the forest for these little monkeys, uh, it's protecting it for many, many other wildlife species of the Colombian biodiversity. So many amazing species that share a home with cotton top tamarins. So while this forest works not only for cotton tops, but for every species that shares a home here, and also for people, because we do benefit from ecosystem services. We benefit from the water that the forests protect. Uh, we benefit from the wood and from food and resources if we use them sustainably. And that is where our forest conservation work and our research work connect 
with communities. And uh, just as we involve farmers in our forest restoration work, we work with local communities uh, and the ladies that live in there, their family members of the farmers and the kids. And, and we have other uh, um, projects just as this one, the eco mochilas, we call them, but they're made with, you know, crocheted with recycled plastic bag. Really amazing work that they can do in their homes while they care for their families in a work that has been recognized internationally. And now it's in the runway of some of the fashion designers here in Colombia that are putting them on their shelves. And that provides an income to these ladies and their families and also connects them with cotton top tamarind conservation. And look at these beautiful little guys. <laughs> these are the group of women in local communities make them all sizes. Actually, if you, you know, would love to support these smiling women, you can go into our website and purchase online all of these products. It really helps them uh, make it through. We're now resuming our ecotourism activity where you can come to Colombia, actually check, in, check it out on our website and you can come and um, visit the cotton tops, see the cotton tops, visit the forest, interact with the farmers, interact with the artisans and really have a great day in the field. And that also connects to the school programs that we develop to engage kids with cotton top tamarind conservation. They go through a semester program, they go to the forest and see the monkeys. Well, this was pre-COVID. We have to, we're hoping, keeping our fingers crossed that we can resume this year, these field visits, have a lot of fun in the forest, connect with the monkeys, and then do something about it. You know, with the, with everything you learn, do something about it, share it, uh, help, you know, share with your family, with your friends, and just make it fun for the kids and for the communities to understand the importance of protecting cotton tops how that benefits us, and how can I help? And, you know, my regards to my team in here in Colombia, uh, very passionate individuals working uh, in all of these programs to secure a long-term future for the very cute cotton top tamarins, the cutest monkey in the world. Thank you so much. I mean, you're hopelessly biased with cutest monkey in the world, but I think <laughs> that you have, a, you have a good case to make there. I, mean, I do, know. right? I know, I know. Look at this guy. How can you not fall in love with this I, guy? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you, sell, you sell me every year. Every year I go in all jaded being like, no, I think I can make it. This year. Anyway, what is the <laughs> program? Uh, and again, just like uh, Arno and, and for all our programs, the amazing team behind you, the enthusiasm of local community, it's just such a special thing to engage people that way. Community conservation has become uh, a buzzword of sorts, but it's so exciting to see when people really get people of all kinds, all ages, volunteering their time, their their effort, their passion. Um, and so, uh, again, such a huge kudos to you for all your in incredible work. Yeah. Um, with the ecotourism coming back, so ecotourism has, again, become a really big way of getting people interested and engaged in seeing these animals in the wild. Is there an impact on the monkeys? Do you, with the research work that you do, with more people coming into the forest to see them, are they acclimatized to people? Do you see them sort of going away? Do you keep your distance? I know this is a big thing with gorilla conservation in, in Central yes. Africa. How do you find that? No, we, we have, I think we, we are trying to do this the best way possible. Is, so there's a lot of control in the sizes of the groups and the frequencies of the visits and, you know, the protocols just to make sure we don't create any disturbance. Um, we, we usually bring people or our visitors to groups that we have been studying for a while. So they are somehow habituated to our presence. So coming in would not generate, uh, you know, a big stress or any... Uh, major disturbance. They're used to us coming after them, um, you know, following them for a while, taking notes on what they're doing. And some of them are more comfortable than others. You know, we still study animals that keep their distance and then they kind of curiously look at us when we're taking notes in the field. And, um, and then, you know, it makes our work harder, but uh, it gives us an opportunity to guarantee that you can come and see the monkeys with the telemetry we, we use. When we are walking in through the forest and run into a group that is not habituated, then it's very hard to see them. <laughs> I mean, you can walk, you can walk for hours and not see a monkey. So, yes. So the fact that we, that we uh, have this uh, telemetry system that we work with allows us to show our visitors the uh, the monkeys and also to do our day-to-day -day because this is a day-to-day -day thing. So these groups are visited daily. 
this basically the force is the the, the team's office <laughs> every day with mosquitoes and all included uh and they you know they they that's that's what they do just uh make sure the animals are okay monitor them document everything because it's very valuable information for us it's it's yeah. been it's been amazing to have so much data and i think it's a, it's a, every biologist dream to have so much data to process and and understand for these animals and use it for protecting them and, and securing a long-term future for them. Yeah, I love that answer. And, and honestly, I, I think it's such a special opportunity for anyone who's tuning into this broadcast, wherever you are in the world, you've had the chance to interact and see uh, one of these creatures that we're featuring in the Global Biodiversity Festival in person. It changes your life, whether that's a monkey or an elephant or a manatee or a stingray. I mean, it's just so special to see something live that is different than anything you can experience, even virtually. And I love the opportunity to share this virtually, but I hope our, our audience gets the chance to come to Columbia and see the Tamarins in person. What a, what a special thing. Uh, Natasha has been our like go-to all-star audience member. She's been here since the beginning of the festival today with Bobby to kick us off a few hours ago with Joe. And so she wants to know a technical question about the monkeys. What's the difference between the dry forest cotton top tamarins and the ones endemic to the rainforest like the golden mantle tamarind? Are there physiological differences, anything behavioral, anything you can share with us? Yeah, some, some, of, some of them have the same genus, so they're just different species. Uh, like uh, there is, I believe, I believe if I'm not wrong, it's about 16 different species of tamarins or small monkeys uh, uh, in uh, South America. Colombia, there's at least eight different uh, species. And this one that we work with, which is the cotton top tamarins, are only are endemic from Colombia, from the north region of Colombia. And there's another one endemic that lives in the center of the country. And basically, is there adaptation to the local weather? So cotton top tamarins go through a long uh, span of not rain and uh, very scarce food in the forest, because if there's no rain, most of the trees drop their leaves. There's nothing to eat fruit wise <laughs> until the first rains in the year start coming and the trees start uh, blooming again. So they are, you know, they are smart. So they, you know, they learn to eat insects and they feed from insects during the dry season and also from sap from the trees. And that gives them a lot of energy and a lot of uh, calories so they can kind of get by. Um, usually animals in the tropical rainforest don't go through that. So they have, you know, kind of a different, different diet and different uh, um, adaptations to their environment. But that's what that's that would be the difference, you know. In um, in one of our locations, it's six six months out of the year with no rain, and six months with a lot of rain. In some other locations in our work sites, it's every three months. You know, you get like three months of rain, three months of non-rain, and yeah. animals adapt very well to that, especially for their diet. Yeah. Thanks, Rosemira. Um, speaking of adapting, one of the pictures you showed very early in your presentation was this little monkey with a big, big backpack. And we've done programs for kids before, and I'm curious, does that impact them as they're moving through the forest? Do you see a monkey go for a leap and he's just too heavy and he goes <laughs> a little bit lower or what happens? No, actually that that is like if it's, it's it, the weight of that transmitter, it looks it looks heavy, but it's not. It's just 15 grams. It's very, very light. And uh, actually, this system was designed based on their biology because they are used to carrying the babies on the back, like you saw in the in the first image of of the of the male carrying two babies in the back. Uh, they do for more than ten weeks carry the babies in the back, and so they're used to having something, uh, some weight on their back. And mm, thirty years that we have been studying cotton top tamarins in the wild. We have never seen any impact or any um, any uh, aspect that affects their behavior. They're moving through the forest, their um, interactions with other species. So it's been an amazing uh, tool for us to be able to study the animals, learn from them, and use all of that information to protect the species. So there's no um, evidence that or any documentation that it creates any issues for us. Well, I love that you sort of took inspiration from their ecology with the, the babies right. in the back. We have, uh, again, Natasha has been mentioning the design background and art, like uh, it's just, it really helps a lot um, when you're planning these things and how to interact with animals, how to put things on them. We've had critter cam, of course, is something that we've seen a lot in our programs. And, and there's a lot of thought that goes into that before you 
do it with yeah. a particular species. So yeah, that's I think that's a challenge for every biologist is try to track the animals with no, uh, you know, you know, making sure that their welfare is above everything. And that's you know we we certainly play that rule. Yeah. Outstanding. Yeah. Now I, I I love this question again, Natasha. If anyone else in the chat <laughs> wants to share questions, please feel free. Don't be shy. But Natasha's killing it. So I always love, I'm an educator by background, so any question related to education, I think is really important. You spend so much of your talk at the end emphasizing that. So more about the way you communicate these species to children. When you're talking to classrooms, you know, you have puppets, you have uh, stuffies, you have coloring activities. How do you plan that? What's the response you get from kids? Anything you can share would be great. Yeah, we, we have learned to communicate with different audiences, trying to uh, have a relevant speech to them. So something that they care about. So when we talk with farmers, we talk about water conservation for their cattle. We talk about uh, food production sustainably for their families. When we talk with kids, it's all about fun. So it needs to be storytelling. You know, we use a lot of storytelling. We use a lot of role play. We use a lot of games. And the puppets are one of the most successful and popular strategy we have used, especially with kids between probably uh, five to 10 years, so elementary school mostly. And uh, we now, because of the COVID, we had to adjust, like Arnaud was telling us, we all had to adjust to something. So we created this traveling puppet show that has become very, very popular. So we usually focus on a couple of, of things. The fact that cotton tops are only found in Colombia, so we go straight to the heart and say, hey, we need to be proud that we have this animal. We are the only ones in the world that have this animal here, right? And, and that is like, wow, really? Oh, that, that means I'm special and they're special. Yes, they are special. And then, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just connecting the culture and the art and the dancing and the painting. That has been the best tools uh, it, that we have found to be very effective with kids. And we are evaluating pre and post all of our education programs to have evidence that is working. So they're retaining information. They are committing to their age level, of course, to not having cotton tops as pests, which is our main message for all of our education programs, and to become active, to share the information, to share with their friends, and to be just, you know, cotton top friendly communities. That's that's our goal. And you know, we're making a huge effort in evaluating everything because it's a huge, you know, it's 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 we need to make sure that it's working. And thankfully, you know, we are seeing good evidence that it is. You really do epitomize this use of research to prove the stuff yes. that you're doing is effective in everything that you do. And I think it's so, so important. We're seeing this more and more from conservationists around the globe. It's one thing to dive in and have a passion and then start working towards the conservation of a species. But once you have that data, you get funding, you get support, you get people that want to work with you. And I think that's such an important element of this. Rosemira, every time I chat with you, my face hurts from smiling, which is a good problem to have in conservation. I think everyone leaves our, our broadcast like that. Uh, but I just want to thank you so much for sharing uh, everything today. Again, this is going to live online forever. And your your website is just a spectacular tool to learn about that education work, the conservation work, so, so much more. You're active in all sorts of uh, areas, just like Arno was uh, before you. So I, I really appreciate that. And I hope all thank our you. audience. Thank you, Jesse. And and our social media is at Project Oditi. Very easy to find. You can contact us through there. And, you know, we'll be happy to share more information if any of you wants to know more about evaluation or education programs and research for us. And, you know, hope we've motivated you to support our work. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Joe. And have a great evening and a great weekend. Thank you so much, Rosemary. I hope you can tune in for more. I think we've got some more Colombian broadcasting soon. Of course <laughs> I will. <laughs>